This is your basic guide to reading EKGs. Every time you approach an EKG, you need to approach it in the exact same manner every single time. And that's by following these five steps, rate, rhythm, axis, intervals, and morphology. This is how it's always going to be taught in medical school. And every single time a, an attending hands you an EKG, you need to go step by step through this process and show them that you know how to approach this in a systematic manner. So the first thing that we're going to look at is the rate. So there's three ways to calculate the rate. The first one is kind of sarcastic, but just look at the top of the EKG and you can see that the heart rate is 70. But more than that, you have to know the other two ways to calculate the heart rate. And one of the most common ways to do that is to look at the number of big boxes in between each QRS complex. And by big box, I'm talking about these boxes that are drawn out like this. So basically, if you count from this QRS complex here and you do one box here, two, three, four, you get about four big boxes. And then you take the number 300, you divide it by four big boxes and you get an approximate heart rate of about 75. Sometimes, however, you have an irregular heartbeat and you're not going to be able to accurately count how many big boxes are in between each QRS complex. So what you do in this situation instead is you count every single QRS complex on the rhythm strip. So here we have 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And you multiply that by 6 because this rhythm strip is 10 seconds long. So that's going to get you an approximate heart rate of 12 times 6 or 72 beats per minute. So number of QRS complexes in the rhythm strip, which is usually lead two, and multiply that by six. So these are the ways you can calculate the rate. Once you finish calculating the rate, then the next step is to look at the rhythm. So you're going to tell your attending that there's two things you're looking at when you're looking for the rhythm. First, you want to check, is this a regular or an irregular rhythm? And in this case, you can see that it's very regular. All of the QRS complexes are coming at the exact same time. And the other important thing that you need to mention every time is that you see a, an upright P wave in lead two, and there's a P before every QRS and a QRS after every P. This is telling you essentially that the rhythm is most likely coming from the sinus node. After assessing the rhythm, we're going to move on to axis. So axis is basically determining the orientation of the heart. So why do we care about looking for the axis deviation? So right axis deviation simply can tell us if there's potentially right ventricular hypertrophy, and left axis deviation can tell us if there's left ventricular hypertrophy. But more in general, it kind of gives us an idea of different pathologies that could be going on with the heart. Now, there's two ways to look at the uh, axis. The one that I'm going to be teaching you is the quadrant method, which is definitely the most simple. And then you'll see some people, you know, advocating for this isoelectric lead method. It's seems very cumbersome to me, so I've never really used that. Now, you don't really need to have an understanding of how the quadrant method works in order to understand how to use it and calculate the axis, but I wanted to go over it briefly because I feel like having an understanding of how it actually works does make you a better and more knowledgeable doctor. So, you know, we have all these different leads uh, that are, you know, placed when we're doing a 12 lead EKG, and the ones that we're going to use for the quadrant method are lead one and lead two. Now, lead one is created when you make the right arm negative and and you make the left arm of the patient positive. And basically, whenever the heart has a depolarization, any depolarization going in this direction is going to cause a positive uh, QRS complex on the EKG. So in lead one, if you have a positive QRS complex, that's basically telling you that the depolarization of the heart is somewhere in this direction. The other lead we're going to look at is lead two. And lead two is when you make the right arm of the patient negative and you make the legs of the patient positive. This gives you this plus 60 degree axis for lead two. And same principle that if the depolarization of the heart is generally in this direction, then you are going to get a positive QRS complex. So positive QRS complex here is going to correspond to this area. Now let's combine these two together, and you'll see that there's this area of overlap such that if you had a positive QRS complex in lead two and a positive QRS complex in lead one, and that's basically telling you that the orientation of the heart is in this direction. And that nicely corresponds to a normal orientation of the heart, as you can see here. Normal axis is right here, a left axis is going to be up here, and a right axis down here. This is why I tend to use lead one and lead two, because this corresponds to the normal axis of a heart. Some people use lead one and lead AVF, but that's only going to be calculating this area right here. And you're going to be missing this uh, part of the normal orientation, uh, which you may see in a normal axis of the heart. 
All right, now that we've talked about the you know mechanics of how this actually works, let's just you know actually go through the practical way of using the quadrant method to calculate the axis. So basically, you just want to look for where the QRS complexes are upright. So you're looking at lead one and lead two, and if you see an upright uh, QRS complex in lead one and lead two, then just give two thumbs up, and that's telling you that it's a normal axis. Okay, so lead one is going to be your left hand, and lead two is going to be your right hand. Illustrating it again, lead one is positive, lead two is positive, and so the overlap is in the middle right here. Now, next example, we have a positive QRS complex in lead one and a negative complex in lead two. So for this, you're gonna do a thumbs up with your left hand and a thumbs down with your right hand. And basically, whatever thumb is pointing up is going to tell you where the, the axis deviation lies. So your left thumb is pointing up. So this is telling you that there's left axis deviation. And to illustrate that on here, so you have a positive QRS in lead one, and you have a negative complex in lead two, which means that uh, the d depolarization is going in this direction. And so this is telling you that there's left axis deviation in this quadrant right here. Final example, so uh, we have a negative complex in lead one and a positive complex in lead two. So thumbs down for lead one, thumbs up for uh, lead two, and right thumb is pointing up, so you have right axis deviation. That corresponds to a negative uh, complex in lead one here and a positive complex here, which is giving you this area right here. All right, so now you've calculated the rate, the rhythm, and the axis. Now it's time to move on to the intervals. So the intervals are basically going to be looking at three main things. So the first one we want to look at is the PR interval. So you get your P wave here, and the R is going to be the R wave of your QRS complex. Then you're going to look at the interval of the QRS complex itself. And then finally, you're going to want to look at the QT interval. Okay, those are the three main intervals that you're going to be looking for. So the PR interval is normally going to be between 120 and 200 milliseconds, or three to five small boxes. The QRS interval should be less than 120 milliseconds, or about three small boxes. And the QT interval should be less than 50% of the R to R interval. That's a good way to eyeball if somebody has a prolonged QT interval or not. So the R to R interval is uh, the R complex is here, and then the R wave is here. So 50% of that should be where your uh, QT interval ends. And then you can see in this example, the QT interval is less than 50% of the R to R interval. And so that's telling you that this is basically doesn't appear to be a prolonged QT interval. So this is again showing you the different intervals that we're gonna be looking at. So you wanna look at the start of the P wave to the start of the QRS complex, that's gonna be the PR interval. That should be less than 200 milliseconds. And then you want to look at the QRS complex itself, should be less than 120 milliseconds. And then you wanna look for the QT interval, which should be less than 50% of the R to R interval as seen up here. This is gonna be just a little preview of some of the uh, rhythms we're gonna look at later on in this presentation. Um, but here I've just shown some AV blocks here, and you can see here that we're depicting first degree AV block, which is a prolonged PR interval. So the PR interval is greater than five big boxes, and that basically meets the definition for a first degree AV block. A second degree AV block, uh, Mobitz type one, is when you get a progressively longer and longer PR interval. So you can see how the PR interval is getting longer and longer. And then suddenly uh, you have a dropped QRS complex. A second degree AV block is a, uh, you know, the PR interval is not getting more and more prolonged and then you have a dropped P, uh, QRS complex. And then we've got a third degree AV block here where the P wave and the Q, QRS complex have no real correlation uh, with each other. You can see the P waves just marching along here. Uh, and then the QRS complexes are just going on at, at a completely different pace. I also wanted to tell you a little bit about the nomenclature of how to name your uh, QRS waves. So basically, whatever the biggest wave is going to be is going to be capitalized. So you can see that if you have a big Q wave and a big R wave, then you have a big Q and a big R. And whatever the first def uh, negative deflection is, is called the uh, Q wave. And whatever the first positive deflection is, is going to be the R wave. And then if you have another deflection after an R wave, it's gonna be called an S wave. So you can see here, we just start with a positive deflection and then a negative deflection. And you can see that the negative deflection is much bigger than the positive deflection. So you have a little R and a big S wave here. Here we have an RS R prime wave, uh, basically because there's a second R wave, that's why it's called R prime here. Uh, here we've got a little Q uh, and a big R, and that's how basically you're gonna approach naming these different waves.
Now moving back onto the QRS complex, so you're going to be really differentiating between narrow complexes and wide QRS complexes. So narrow QRS complexes are basically telling you that the origin of the heartbeat is supraventricular and it's conducting down its normal pathways, whereas a wide QRS complex is suggesting that you're not going through the normal conduction system and so everything's a lot slower, so things get prolonged and you get this really, really wide uh, QRS complex like this. So usually these are beats that are coming from the ventricles themselves instead of above the ventricles, or you may have some aberrant conduction such as bundle branch blocks, which we'll talk about later. So and then finally, in this example here, this is going to be an example of a prolonged QT interval. Remember, we're looking at that R to R interval. And if you are greater than 50% of that R to R interval, that's telling you that it's likely a prolonged QT interval. A couple of things to note. So QT intervals shorten with tachycardia, but they lengthen with bradycardia. So if somebody is bradycardic, they're going to be at higher risk for trissades than if they had a, a very tachycardic heart rate. And in order to correct their QT interval based on their heart rate, we use what's called the Bizet's formula, which is often automatically calculated for you on computers these days. Now, finally, we're going to be talking about morphology. So you've gone through all of these steps and you've talked about all of these with the attending when you're reading the EKG. And again, I always want you to go through this systematically in the same order, even if it looks like a normal EKG. Uh, this is the way that you're not going to miss things and you're going to show that you actually know how to interpret an EKG. So let's talk about morphology next. So first, we like to look for uh, signs of hypertrophy, and then we like to look for signs of ischemia. So in terms of the signs of hypertrophy, we look for right atrial enlargement, right ventricular hypertrophy, left atrial enlargement, or left ventricular hypertrophy. So the first thing, uh, the first area I look at is in lead two. And for looking for right atrial enlargement, it's actually fairly simple. You just look at the P wave. And if the P wave is greater than 2.5 millimeters in lead two, then that's a sign of right atrial enlargement. Right ventricular hypertrophy is a little bit more uh, involved. So you're looking for right axis deviation, plus in lead V1, you're looking for an R wave that's greater than the S wave, okay? Because V1 normally is gonna be more of an S wave, it's gonna be more negative. So if you see an R wave greater than S wave, that suggests right ventricular hypertrophy. So remember, how do we calculate right axis deviation or how do we calculate uh, deviation, axis deviation in general? So remember, we're looking at lead one and lead two, you're gonna have a thumbs down in lead one and a thumbs up with your right hand in lead two, which is telling you that there is right axis deviation on this EKG. And then finally, we look at V1. You can see that there's a very tall R wave and there's really no or minimal S wave. And so that's telling you with this combination, you have right ventricular hypertrophy. All right, next step is to look for left atrial enlargement. There's gonna be two places that you can look for this. You're gonna either look in lead two or in lead V1 or both. So in lead two, you're gonna look for this kind of M-shaped bifid P wave is how they describe it. So I just look for the M. As you know, when we talked about right atrial enlargement, we talked about that really tall pointed P wave. Here, you're looking for this wide M-shaped P wave. And then in lead V1, what you're looking for, so normally you have this biphasic appearance of uh, the P wave in lead V1. If this deflection becomes more negative than positive, or the negative part is longer than the positive part, then that suggests left atrial enlargement. So you can see here, the positive part is just tiny little guy right here and then it's this huge negative biphasic part right here that's suggesting left uh, left atrial enlargement so you're looking for a broad bifid p wave in lead two or a negative portion of the biphasic p wave in v1 which is prolonged or it's especially deep now let's look at left ventricular hypertrophy, one of the most common things you're going to be looking at. And there's multiple different criteria for actually assessing for this. So uh, one of the things that I like to look for is the easiest one, which is lead AVL. So if you look at lead AVL, if you are more than 11 small boxes, then that meets uh, LVH criteria. Another common criteria that we do is you look for the most negative S wave in either lead V1 or V2. So in this case, you have this huge negative S wave right here. And then you look for the most positive S wave in lead V5 or V6, and you add them together. So if this one was say 25 small boxes, and this one's like over 25 small boxes too, and if they add up to over 35, then that is diagnostic for left ventricular hypertrophy. So uh, R wave and AVL greater than 11 millimeters, 
or the S wave in V1, V2, plus the R wave in V5, V6, greater than 35 millimeters. Here again, I'm going to show the LVH criteria. So this is the very popular Sokolov Lion uh, criteria that we talked about. And then we talked about the Framingham criteria with the R wave greater than 11. Uh, the other one I want you to know about is the Cornell criteria, which is sometimes used as well. And this is looking at the S wave in V3 and then the R wave in AVL. And if it's greater than 28 millimeters in men or greater than 20 millimeters in women, then that's also positive for LVH. Another thing that I want you to notice, because this is going to come up really shortly, is look at these ST depressions here after this huge, um, you know, these huge R waves. This is what we call a strain pattern, basically because the LVH is causing a repolarization abnormality and causing this kind of strain pattern here. And this is going to be differentiated from ischemic T wave inversions, uh, which we'll go into very shortly as well. All right, and last thing before we move on to specific types of EKGs and findings that you should look for is knowing which particular leads correspond to what area of the heart. So we've got, uh, you know, the lateral side of the heart, we have the inferior side of the heart, we have the septal, and we have the anterior areas of the heart. So um, one of the uh, mnemonics that you can use to remember this is big lie, little lie, ass backwards, and all. And uh, this is something that a medical student taught me, and I thought it was kind of clever. So, um, you know, if you, if you go like this, big lie, little lie, ass backwards, all, you can see that all of the ones with an L are your lateral leads. So lead 1, AVL, V5, and V6 are your lateral leads. Your inferior leads are 2, 3, and AVF. Your septal leads are V1 and V2, and your anterior leads are V3 and V6. So this is a clever little mnemonic that might help you remember uh, what leads correspond to what area of the heart. Now let's move on to morphology. And first I'm going to start with ischemia, because this is one of the most common reasons that we're going to get EKGs. Patient has chest pain, we need to figure out if they're having a heart attack. And one of the things you want to first look out for is for Q waves. Now Q waves are associated with previous MIs, as is stated down here. And basically, you have what are called pathologic Q waves. So uh, there are places where Q waves should not be. And V2, V3, V4, you really shouldn't see Q waves here. And the fact that you're seeing them here is is abnormal and suggests that there was a prior infarction in this area. In order for it to be pathologic, you usually uh, want to see a Q wave that's at least one third of the size of the R wave. So if the Q wave is like really, really tiny and then there's a huge R wave, that might be just kind of like a, an artifact. Um, but if you have a significant one like here, you can see that this is basically at least one third of the R wave. This is definitely significant and pathological. The one place that you may see uh, normal Q waves is uh, in lead three. So there's a saying, Q waves in lead three, let it be. And now this is not uh, always true, but if you see a random Q wave in lead three and there's no other signs to suggest that there was you know, previous ischemia there or, or active ischemia there, then you can just let, you, you can just kind of ignore it. Okay, the next one I want to go over is a very, very common one that you're going to see all the time, and this is going to be T wave inversions, okay? So T wave inversions is when you have the normal T wave, it should be going up in basically all leads. There's only two leads where it's normal to have an inverted T wave, and that's lead AVR and V1. So these are normal. Okay, but any inverted T waves anywhere else is abnormal. And so here you can see inverted T waves in two, three, and AVF, which is really signifying possible active ischemia in the inferior leads um, or the inferior portion of the heart on this EKG. One thing you do need to do in this situation is compare it to an old EKG, however, because if the patient um, had these previous T wave inversions here and they are completely stable, then that suggests that this is just chronic and they probably did have some infarct in the past um, and it's not really a new finding. Another thing to note here is again, we're seeing those pathologic Q waves. So we've got Q waves in all of these inferior leads, again, suggesting some prior ischemia here. And uh, if you see these Q waves here, these ones are non-pathologic because look how tiny they are compared to, compared to the uh, QRS complex. All right, now moving on to some of the T wave changes uh, I wanted to talk to you about earlier. So remember when I mentioned LVH can cause a bit of a repolarization abnormality and cause this uh, LVH strain pattern? Look at the difference between how it looks between um, an ischemic T wave pattern, where it's a very sharp down, you know, pointy shape like this, whereas the strain, which is kind of this slow and 
kind of more gentle curve like this. So this is something that you should be aware of to differentiate between uh, a T wave inversion that's concerning for ischemia versus one that's probably more likely due to strain. So this is strain versus ischemia. Now let's move on to some actual EKGs. And, um, you know, let's say you've already examined this EKG. You've already looked at the rate, rhythm, axis, and intervals. And now we're already on the morphology part. And immediately some things should stand out to you because this is a STEMI or an ST elevation myocardial infarction. And you can see these really huge ST elevations in V2, V3, um, and V1, V4. And we also see these reciprocal ST depressions in uh, the contralateral leads like 2, 3, and AVF. And you can also see uh, ST elevations here. So we're getting basically... Um, basically all the anterior septal leads, we're getting lateral leads, and then we're getting reciprocal changes in the inferior leads. You definitely need to know the classic appearance of an ST elevation MI, and you can see this is basically the classic tombstoning appearance. Now, one thing I want you to know is what is the actual definition of ST elevation? And so an ST elevation is defined by an ST elevation of greater than one millimeter in all leads except for V2 and V3. V2 and V3 have a slightly more lenient criteria. So in females, the, the um, threshold for calling an ST elevation would be 1.5 millimeters. In men greater than 40 years old, it's greater than two millimeters. And in men less than 40 years old, it's greater than 2.5 millimeters. So this is very important to know because you will be asked what is actually the definition of an ST elevation. Another question you may be asked is, what does it suggest if there's an ST elevation in lead AVR? That's going to be suggesting a left main coronary artery occlusion. And if you watch my uh, video on acute coronary syndrome, which I'll link down uh, below, you'll know a little bit more about why that's important. But basically, we have all of this coronary blood flow to the heart. You have the right coronary artery supplying like the inferior regions of the heart. You got the LAD, the widow maker. You got the circumflex artery supplying the lateral sides of the heart. But this main coronary artery right here, if you have a blockage right here, you may see an ST elevation in lead AVR, okay? And lead AVR is right here. So if you see an ST elevation here, you may be concerned for a left main coronary artery uh, occlusion. All right, next EKG here. So what are we seeing here? Well, again, we're seeing all of these ST elevations everywhere, okay? And it's kind of diffuse. So you got diffuse ST elevations. Uh, pretty much in almost all of the leads, right? Not only that, but I want you to take a note at the PR uh, segments, which are also depressed. And the final point I want to mark out here is you've got these like J-point elevations. So um, you'll look, the, just look this up. You can find the J-point. It's basically this little point right after the QRS complex. So we've got diffuse ST elevations, PR segment depressions, and J-point elevations. What is this going to be a sign of? Um, you probably all know it from this buzzword of the diffuse ST elevations. It's going to be acute pericarditis. The only reason that I bring up these other two is because sometimes, or oftentimes actually in my experience, you will not see the diffuse ST segment elevations and you will instead see the PR segment depressions or J-point elevations. And in the right clinical context, that should clue you into acute pericarditis. So these are all findings of acute pericarditis. Now we've got another interesting EKG here. And the main thing that I wanted to point out here is you have an S wave here, you have a Q wave here, and you have an inverted T wave here. Now this is called the S1, Q3, T3 pattern. And this is basically pathognomonic for pulmonary embolism. So this is a very uh, commonly pimped uh, question of, you know, what's the pathognomonic EKG finding for pulmonary embolism? And the answer would be S1, Q3, T3. There is sometimes a trick question that you're going to get for pulmonary embolism is what is the most common EKG finding for pulmonary embolism? And that would be sinus tachycardia. So don't get confused on that. I will say that I have seen S1Q3, T3 in many patients who do not have pulmonary embolism. They just have other, sign, uh, other reasons for right heart strain. So a lot of times you're going to see a patient with right axis deviation. They might have right ventricular hypertrophy or right atrial enlargement. And they have S1Q3, T3. Maybe if they got pulmonary hypertension or something else causing elevated right-sided heart pressures. And it's not necessarily saying that they have a PE because they have this EKG finding. Now we've got this EKG here. And what I really want you to take a note of is these really peaked uh, T waves. And this is going to be a sign of hyperkalemia. So remember, peaked T waves, 
is a sign of hyperkalemia. And then as it gets worse, as you get worsening hyperkalemia, you'll start to get a prolonged QRS. And eventually it's going to turn into this sine wave. And that's really, you know, you're kind of too far gone at that point. You, you should have treated their potassium much higher, much earlier than that. So this is kind of the progression of hyperkalemia. Definitely make sure you know about the peak to T waves. And this one's a little bit harder. So this one, I'm just going to point out to you. Uh, you have this like flattened T wave here. And then you have this all of a sudden a new wave right here. And this one is actually called a U wave uh, because your T wave really should be right here. So you got a flattened T wave and then you got this extra wave right here. This is another example here, a little bit more noticeable. Like look how you know negative this T wave is going. And then all of a sudden you get this extra wave right here. Finally, uh, I'm going to point out to you what the U wave is. So you know this is a normal T wave right here. And if you get an extra wave right here, this is called a U wave. So when you see these signs, these are signs of hypokalemia. So what I want you to look for is a U wave or this kind of camelback shape after the QRS complex. Or if you see a really flattened or negative T wave and then all of a sudden an extra wave comes up, that's gonna be another sign of a U wave uh, that's consistent with hypokalemia. All right, this one here, we've got a patient with an irregularly irregular rhythm. There's no clear P wave. Remember, we look in lead two to see a P wave uh, that's upright in lead two and before every QRS. Can't really say for comp you know confidently that there is a Q wave. And then if you look in V1, uh, you've got this like really undulating uh, or you could say fibrillating uh, baseline uh, right here. And so this is going to be an example of atrial fibrillation. Now you know let's see what the rate is. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. 17 times six, this patient's heart rate is 102. So this is actually uh, qualifies for atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response or AFib with RVR because his heart rate is above 100. This is a very similar pattern, uh, although we've had, we have a more regular rhythm this time and we see these sawtooth patterns of um, you know a, a baseline right here. And so this is gonna be atrial flutter. So again, looking for that sawtooth pattern. Now, um, you can get atrial flutter with a uh, specified block. So we've got one flutter wave here, two, three, and there's a fourth one here. So this is called a four to one uh, flutter with four to one AV block. Okay, but sometimes you can get a atrial flutter with variable AV block, and that's when you're gonna get a flutter with these, these um, sawtooth waves, but then you're gonna have kind of a, a more irregular heart, heart rate like this. So you'll get a regularly irregular heart rate, even though it's atrial flutter. So that would be if you have atrial flutter with an, a variable AV block. Now let's take a look at this EKG. I'm trying to remember what I put this EKG in here for. Um, really what I'm seeing right off the bat are these really huge uh, P waves here. But then uh, as soon after I'm looking and I'm like, hey, how come all these P waves are different? So I'm going down here, oh shoot, this is like an ir irregularly irregular rhythm. There's multiple P waves of different morphologies. So if you have this scenario, this is called multifocal atrial tachycardia. This is going to be you know, three or more uh, different P wave morphologies in an, and an irregularly irregular rhythm. And this is commonly an arrhythmia that arises in patients with long-standing lung disease. They'll get this multifocal atrial tachycardia, multiple P waves, irregularly irregular rhythm, and the treatment is to treat their underlying lung disorder. Now moving on to this EKG, um, immediately off the bat, I'm seeing some T wave inversions right here. And uh, what really stands out to me actually is uh, this slurred upstroke of the QRS. So um, this one is actually going to be uh, going to be Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. So Wolf Parkinson White syndrome is when you have uh, this you know accessory pathway in the heart. So you got the heart right here. Normally all your signals should travel down, right? through your SA node, your AV node, and then up the bundle of Hiss and uh, to depolarize your ventricles. But sometimes you get this accessory pathway and uh, some of your signals can travel down there and cause this slurred upstroke of the QRS. So this is called a delta wave. So the slurred QRS upstroke or delta wave. You may also see a shortened PR interval because you have this. So shortened PR. These are the three findings I want you to remember. And you may also see a prolonged QRS. Okay. So these are the three findings that I want you to know 
for wolf parkinson white syndrome so make sure you look for that this comes up very frequently on the boards and they don't really tell you you just got to look out for that delta wave with the slurred qrs so just to look at a normal qrs look how sharp this qrs is and then if you go here it's like a very slurred slow uprise now this one, very rapid heart rate. Uh, you know, if I go into how many big boxes are in between here, two big boxes in between. So it's basically a heart rate of 150. 300 divided by two is 150. And this is gonna be an example of AVRT. It's a supraventricular tachycardia. If you've got a narrow complex. Um, and I mainly wanted to put this in here to compare it to AVNRT. Again, here you've got a pretty rapid heartbeat. Um, and then uh, again, a heart rate of about 150. But in this one, you're actually seeing some uh, little upstrokes right here after the QRS complex. These are called retrograde P waves. And uh, this is going to be AVNRT. So, you know, this is a whole different talk for a, a different lecture of, you know, talking about SVTs, including AVRT and AVNRT. But uh, one of the key findings I want you to know about is if you ever see a tachycardia, a regular narrow complex tachycardia with retrograde P waves, you should be thinking about AVNRT. Uh, this one I just briefly wanted to include here, which is paroxysmal atrial tachycardia. Uh, this is one I still struggle with sometimes. You know, when the teletechs, uh, you know, tell me, hey, patients in PAT or paroxysmal atrial tachycardia. But basically, you have your normal P wave here, and you can see it's got a very similar morphology. All of a sudden, you start to become tachycardic, and you've got a different P wave morphology. So this is basically this ectopic focus, you know, instead of having the normal uh, SA node depolarize and, and causing the normal P wave, you get this ectopic focus over here and that's suddenly driving the heart causing this tachycardia so you get this new uh p wave uh, morphology and you get a, a pretty rapid tachycardia as well as paroxysmal atrial tachycardia all right now i want to move on to a very very common set of findings that you're going to see in multiple ekgs and i remember as a medical student i really nobody told me what pvcs are and pacs are but this is what you're looking for so if you see a normal ekg and then all of a sudden you see this wide bizarre qrs complex that comes out all out of nowhere it's premature you can see you know you know the normal beat should have happened somewhere around here but you get this premature beat right here this is called a premature ventricular contraction a pvc and on the other hand you can have what are called pacs premature atrial attack contractions and as you notice here again you get this premature contraction but it looks a lot more like the normal qrs complex the main thing here is that it's earlier than it should have been and there's no associated p wave so again if you have this wide bizarre premature complex it's a ventricular uh, contraction and if you have a narrow complex it's going to be uh, most likely a pac so PAC versus PVCs. Uh, I also wanted to briefly talk about bigeminy. So you'll hear this term thrown around. So this is when you have normal QRS and then uh, PVC and then normal QRS PVC in this same pattern. This is called ventricular bigeminy. And then you can also get trigeminy and quadrigeminy. So trigeminy is going to be two normal QRSs and then a PVC. Q two normal PVC, two normal PVC. So that's trigeminy. Very common, you should definitely know about PVC and PACs because you're going to see them all the time on your EKGs. Now I just want to talk briefly about wide QRS tachycardias. So what happens if you have multiple PVCs in a row or you get a PVC that triggers an arrhythmia, that's going to be called uh, ventricular tachycardia. So basically imagine if one PVC suddenly became multiple PVCs all in a row or it triggered you know, this long run of PVCs, that's called VTAC or ventricular tachycardia. You can also get polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. This is if it's, you know, the PVCs are all coming from different locations. And then also you've got torsades to points, uh, which is when you get this undulate, undulating, like sign-like pattern, uh, which often happens when patients have uh, prolonged QT intervals, and then they get a Q PVC on top of the QT interval, and this precipitates this wide complex tachycardia. All right, this one's going to be very brief, but here uh, we have... Uh, a, a rhythm that's a little bit slow, it's a little bit on the bradycardic side, and you can notice that there's no P wave in front of every QRS. This is uh, me just showing you an example of what's called a junctional rhythm. So imagine you have your heart, and normally you have your SA node sending signals down here. Well, what if something happens, and this is not working? Uh, then the heart is going to have a backup system, and it's going to use the AV node, and it's going to generate electrical signals uh, like this. However, the, the signals that are generated here are slow lower than the normal SA node. So if the normal SA node has a normal heartbeat of 60 to 80 beats per minute, and that's sinus rhythm, 
your junctional rhythm is going to be around 40 to 60 beats per minute. All right, and then this one here, say that this got blocked off and now your heart rate, your heart is like really trying to find a backup uh, to figure out you know, how to keep beating and not basically just stop beating completely. Well, then you got what's called a ventricular escape rhythm. You can see that this is even slower. It's associated with these wide QRS complexes because remember, anytime you see a wide QRS complex that's telling you that the depolarization is basically coming from the ventricle because it's not going down the normal conduction pathways, and the ventricular escape rhythm is gonna be 20 to 40 beats per minute. So these are all backup systems. If your SAO node is not working or your AV node is not working, then you get all these different escape rhythms to try and salvage your heart and make sure it doesn't stop beating completely. So these are important things for you to know because I remember they came up very frequently in intern year and I had no idea what people were talking about until you know I spent some time looking it up. So now this one right here, a uh, very interesting EKG. I'm trying to think about what this is. Um, hmm, I actually can't remember what this, oh yes, I remember what this is now. So uh, these are all very wide QRS complexes, right? And uh, the heart rate is actually relatively normal. So it's got uh, one, two, three big boxes. So heart rate is like 90 to, it's like 100. So 300 divided by three. That's 100, that's not too bad, right? But you're getting all these wide QRS complexes, which again, tells me that it's coming from the ventricle, right? Wide QRS equals the uh, rhythm is coming from the ventricle. So this is an example of what's called accelerated idioventricular rhythm. This is something that is very commonly seen after an MI and somebody gets reperfusion and, and basically, uh, or basically just an MI in general, they can have this ventricular escape rhythm, but then uh, somehow their heart is able to accelerate that in ventricular rhythm. So instead of having the uh, ventricular escape rhythm here that where you get the 20 to 40 beats per minute, it's actually accelerated it to a more adequate heart rate and you're actually uh, getting a, a decent heart rate out of this. And uh, the management, you really just kind of monitor this and, until it, it resolves over time. Now this one here, I wanted to show you uh, bundle branch blocks. This one right here is a right bundle branch block. And the way I want you to me immediately identify bundle branch blocks is you want to look for this RS, R prime complex in V1 and V2. And you also want to look for a deep slurred S wave in V5 and V6. We don't really see that on this uh, EKG, but definitely this classic RS, R prime, very, very indicative of a right bundle branch block. In contrast, this is going to be a left bundle branch block. Left bundle branch block, you're going to be seeing this really, really deep S wave in V1 and V2. Uh, I had a medical student tell me that they learned it as a deep carrot, like there, almost like there's a carrot here, if you can imagine. There's basically, if I just drew a carrot, you know, with this little thief there. They just got, got, you got a bunch of carrots in V1 and V2. And then in V5 and V6, you tend to get this like M-shaped broad uh, R wave like this, okay? V5 doesn't really show it here, but it's like this weird M shape. And I'll show you here, comparing left bundle branch and right bundle branch block. This is gonna come up very commonly, but again, right bundle branch block, look for that RSR prime in V1 and V2, and look for the broad and deep S wave in V5 and V6. Left bundle branch block, look for that deep carrot in V1 and V2, and look for the broad and clumsy R wave in V5 and V6. That's how you can look for left and right bundle branch block. Now, sometimes we are going to get uh, something like this, and I actually have to take a look and see what this is. So, um, Oh, and now and now I've suddenly seen it. So this basically goes to show you why you need to do the whole algorithm of rate, rhythm, axis, interval, and morphology. Because you know, because of these, the way that I've made these slides, I've basically just been jumping to morphology. But if you don't go through this really, um, you know, methodological way of going through it, you're going to miss interval, which is what I just noticed now. And so interval, if you look here, we've got the P wave here and the QRS is all the way over there. Okay. So this is a very, very prolonged PR interval. What is that? That's going to be first degree AV block. All right. And then I kind of know the rest of these are in order. So if you see this one here, you've got a P wave here and QRS. P wave, QRS, a little bit longer than before. P wave dropped QRS. So again, you get that pattern. And each time the 
the PR interval seems to be getting a little bit longer each time. Like if you really compare this uh, first PR interval and you compare this last PR interval, you can see how it's been progressively getting longer over time. Then you have a drop. That's going to be second degree AV block type one or MOBITS, which can be often benign uh, and not something that we worry about too much. But when it progresses to second degree type two AV block, that's when we get more concerned. So here we take a look at the PR interval and it is pretty much rock uh, steady solid. Actually, this hmm, this this looks like type one for me. Uh, so I, I think I, I included the wrong uh, interval here uh, or the wrong EKG here. But imagine that all of these PR intervals were the exact same length and then suddenly you dropped uh, the QRS complex. That would be a second degree type two AV block. Now, finally, we've got complete heart block. So we showed you an example earlier, but we got a P wave here. We probably have a P wave in here somewhere. So all of these P waves, what people say is they're marching out. Okay. And there is absolutely no correlation to the QRS complexes, which are just going completely randomly. Like this is completely out of sync. So this is going to be a complete heart block. So you're looking for those P waves that march out with no correlation to the QRS complex. All right, now let's talk about left uh, anterior and posterior hemi blocks because you're going to see this a lot. So you're going to see left anterior fascicular uh, block and a left posterior fascicular block. And I went through all of interior pretty much, not really understanding what the heck this was talking about. But basically, this is a great depiction here. So you have your AV node here, right? And you know this is your bundle of hiss or whatever. And this is how things are conducted through the heart. And you have these different fascicles. So this is your right bundle branch here. And this is your left bundle branch, OK? So when we saw those blocks earlier, you remember what those look like. And if you don't, just rewind the video and you'll see what it looks like. But the left bundle branch block also splits off into an anterior uh, fascicle and a posterior fascicle. And you can sometimes get blocks at these areas too. And it creates kind of this incomplete block uh, where it's not, it doesn't have the morphology of the left bundle branch block, but you still get signs of, you know, a conduction disease in these areas. So what you're looking for in a left anterior fascicular block is you want to look for left axis deviation, plus you want to look for a Q big R in the lateral leads, and you want to look for a little r big S in the inferior leads. So if you look here, we've got left axis deviation by looking at one and two. And then we look at our lateral leads, which are gonna be one and AVL. We can see a basically little Q, big R. And then in, in our inferior leads, we have a little R and a big S, okay? And this is all indicative of left anterior fascicular block. I'm not gonna to go too much into the specifics of why it creates this pattern. Um, you can definitely look that up, but it, it would take a little bit uh, too long to, to describe in this video, and it's already getting pretty long. So basically, let's move on to left posterior hemi block. So now we're blocking this fascicle right here. What you're going to see here is going to be a right axis deviation. So again, look at lead one and lead two. You see downwards, upwards, and your right thumb is pointing up. So you got right axis deviation. And then what you are going to see is a little r big S in the lateral leads. And then you should see a Q big R in the inferior leads. Although I don't really see that here, but um, that is theoretically what you should see. All right, what is it if they call it a bifascicular block? Bifascicular block is when you have a left anterior or posterior uh, hemi block plus a right band bundle branch block, okay? So right bundle branch block plus an LAFB or a LPFB. That is what is determined as a bifascicular block. So this is more evidence that the patient is getting more and more conduction disease. Now, finally, let's say we blocked all three of these. So we blocked the right bundle branch block, the left posterior, the left anterior. This is actually complete heart block. So it's complete heart block because every fascicle is blocked, right? There's nothing going down the normal conduction system. So uh, don't get this confused for what people call trifascicular block. This is a misnomer that a lot of people use. Uh, because a uh, trifascicular block, a lot of people are, are describing a first degree AV block uh, plus a bifascicular block. However, that's not correct. Um, a trifascicular block, sorry, uh, a trifascicular block is basically what we're seeing here. A trifascicular block truly is complete heart block or 
chb so disregard this uh, but a lot of people get this confused including attendings a couple extra questions I wanted to add in here, but what is it called when the QRS is wider than 100 milliseconds, but there are no other criteria for either a bundle branch block or a bifascicular block? That's called a non-specific intraventricular conduction delay. You'll sometimes see that on your EKG reads. And then what if you have a left or right bundle branch block, but the QRS is only 100 to 120 milliseconds, so the QRS is not prolonged past 120 milliseconds. That's called an incomplete bundle branch block. Now moving on, we have a patient here who's got a little bit of an interesting finding. They have a small QRS complex here, then a bigger one, and a smaller one, and a bigger one, and a big one, and a small one, and a big one. This is going to be electrical alternans, and I really want you to recognize this because this is a sign of a pericardial effusion. And what's happening is you've got the pericardial sac and you've got your little heart in there. I'll just draw a heart. And when it fills with a bunch of fluid, like in a pericardial effusion, it's going to start swinging back and forth and causing the QRS amplitudes to be bigger and lower and bigger and lower as it swings back and forth in that sac of fluid. That's why you get that finding of electrical alternance. Now this one is going to be very noticeable for small QRS complexes, and this is called low of low voltage EKG. Now there's a couple of things that can cause this. The most common one is going to be obesity because your EKG leads are going to be traveling through a huge layer of subcutaneous fat. It's going to be very difficult for them to pick up the signal, the electrical signals from the heart. But other things that you can think about are, uh, you know, amyloidosis uh, and, or infiltrative diseases, which can also result in low, low QRS amplitudes. Now we're moving on uh, to this EKG. You know, this is just a throwback to earlier in this presentation. If you still stuck around to this point, I'm very, very impressed. Keep up the great work. You're, you're going to master EKGs just, you know, practicing these principles. Um, but again, AVL greater than 11. We have V1, the S wave in V1 or V2 plus the, S the R wave in V5 and V6 greater than 35. <clears throat> also, we have the S wave in V3 plus the R wave in AVL greater than 28. This is a classic example of left ventricular hypertrophy. And again, you've got that strain pattern uh, because of the left ventricular hypertrophy as well. <clears throat> this is a patient with no palpable pulses, but they have a completely normal looking EKG. I just wanted to put this in here because this is called pulseless electrical activity. When I first started intern year, I didn't realize when somebody was uh, having a cardiac arrest and had pulseless electrical activity or PEA, that basically just means you can't feel a pulse, but they, their EKG, their telemonitor could look completely normal, but they don't have a pulse. So you still, you need to go and start doing CPR right away and start ACLS right away. So PEA oftentimes looks just like normal QRS, uh, normal EKG. Here we've got very deep symmetrical T wave inversions in the lateral leads, and this is going to be classic for hokum. So again, deep symmetrical inverted T waves in the lateral leads. That's consistent with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Now we've got giant T wave inversions, uh, kind of diffusely. That's going to be cerebral T waves. So say somebody had this, like, suffered a massive, you know, cerebral insult, and uh, now they're starting to get all these crazy deep, giant uh, T wave inversions. Those are cerebral T waves. Now in this patient here, we've got uh, interesting T wave inversions here in V2 and V3, um, even in v uh, V4 here. But really, what I want to focus on here is it's kind of got a biphasic component. It kind of goes up and then down up and then down. This is going to be Wellens syndrome. This is actually a very pimpable thing that you might get asked about. But if you see this biphasic appearance of the T waves, especially in V2 and V3, then that should increase your suspicion for critical stenosis of the LAD. So critical stenosis of the LAD. This is an even better example of that biphasic uh, component of Wellens syndrome. So look at this massive up and then down, up and then down. Again, that biphasic component is going to be Wellens syndrome. Now we got this one. Uh, this is going to be seen in patients. And it's got this really weird upsloping ST segment. And this is called De Winter's sign. Uh, this is something that you'll see a lot of the ED people take, be on the lookout for uh, because it is a sign of a potential infarct or, or impending STEMI or MI.
We've got Brugada syndrome here. So uh, Brugada syndrome is one of the long QT syndromes. And there's three different types. Uh, you really just need to know that uh, if you see this weird coved shape like this, or you get this saddleback shaped thing here, or the saddleback shaped thing here, those are all signs of Brugada syndrome uh, or Brugada sign. So look out for that coved ST segment and that saddleback shaped ST segment, and uh, you'll be on your way to identifying Brugada sign when it shows up. A couple last signs you might want to know about. So this one is uh, this weird, you know, J point elevation and this weird sloping uh, T wave down there. This is an Osborne wave. This is associated with hypothermia. So you may see this, especially in patients that you are actively cooling after uh, cardiac arrest. And this one is going to be, again, I can't really describe these. I think they, you know, they describe it a little bit better here, but this is an epsilon wave. So there's a small notch at the terminal portion of the QRS complex. And you just got all this weird stuff going on. Uh, this is uh, an epsilon wave that's characteristic for a condition called arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. So in case you needed to know that. All right, and that's going to be it for this presentation. Very long. If you stuck through it, congratulations. Uh, definitely review the different parts of it that you may not have gotten earlier on. But if I could sum it all into one big sentence, really, I would just want to have you focus and emphasize the methodological approach to interpreting EKGs. Rate rhythm, axis, intervals, and then finally you can focus on all the interesting stuff like the morphology. But you need to go through it in this systematic manner, especially every time somebody is asking you to interpret the EKG because that shows them that you know the correct method and the, the correct way to read the EKG. And it makes sure that you're not gonna miss anything when you are reading the EKG as well. I hope this helped. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Peace.